Don't ever worry about old Max. I'm like Gandalf. I show up exactly at the right moment. I don't know who Gandalf is, but I do hope you bring your, brought your Bible tonight. Make your way over to Matthew 19. I want you to notice a couple of verses there with me in just a minute or two. Matthew 19. This is the fifth Sunday night in 2017 that we have devoted to answering your questions. I hope that's been profitable to you. It is a night we have carved out, carved out specifically with all of you in mind. We know as you do your Bible study, sometimes you stumble across some questions, sometimes when you're sitting in class, sometimes when you're listening to sermons, sometimes when you're talking to people. And we want to have some kind of a venue for you guys to put those questions out there and for us to talk about them together. And you'll find very often that the things you're wondering about are the things that other people are wondering about as well. So please keep sharing your questions with us. And let me just say that tonight, the questions we're addressing about the subject of divorce, we now announced that this morning, we're addressing because they've been raised by you with us. In fact, several over the last several weeks have brought us questions about divorce, and we just decided to be easy to answer those all in one evening, one study. So, a couple of opening thoughts. If you're open there to Matthew 19, look down at verse number 3. When it comes to questions about divorce, the first observation I would make is that these kinds of questions aren't new. And so in Matthew 19, 3, the text says some of the Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? Now, why would that be a, a question his enemies would use to test him? Only because it must have been at that time a controversial subject just as it is a controversial subject today. So take some comfort in the fact that it seems God's people have always wrestled with questions about divorce. And maybe that's because people have always wrestled with their marriages and gone through periods of struggle and have been tempted and have been tempted to bail out. And so it's not a new question. The second thing I want you to look at is verse number 10 as we anticipate our answers. You know, usually when we look at Matthew 19, Max, we, we look at uh, we look at the first nine verses and especially the ninth verse. How many times have you heard someone mention verse 10? And yet, I think verse 10 is really significant because it's the reaction of the disciples when Jesus gets done. Uh, it says in verse 10, the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better, better not to marry. Now, why would they say something like that? Especially if the teaching of Jesus implied, well, if you're not happy, you can always get out. I think they understood that Jesus was implying the exact opposite, that the terms under which a person could leave this relationship were so restrictive and so narrow, it might be better just not to get in at all because you may wind up with someone you don't want and you're going to be stuck. And so I think if we look at the response of the disciples to his teaching, we can anticipate that biblical teaching about divorce is going to be pretty rigid. And let me just say thirdly, as we get all this started, that our plan is to stand with Jesus on that. Amen. Um, that's where this church has always been, and not just about this subject, about every subject. Uh, it has been our determined effort. I think part of the defining spirit of this church that we want to do what Jesus says and that we're determined to figure out what is in his book and to do it no matter how the world feels about it. Is that right? I promise you folks we're going to increasingly be on an island when it comes to this issue. World, the world today just accepts divorce as normal. They would find the teaching of Scripture outrageous and oppressive. And so increasingly if we're going to stand with Jesus on the subject of divorce, we're going to find ourselves more and more isolated more and more out there by ourselves. But I'll tell you what, I know the men who serve as elders here, and we've talked together about this issue. You need to know that they plan to stand with Jesus. And I know many of you in this church, in fact, the, the, the fact that you're in this church, I think, testifies to your determination to stand with Jesus. And so tonight we're going to get in the book, and we're going to look at what Jesus said. So along the way, if we generate some other questions, we have four I bet there are more than four questions about divorce. Uh, if you want to throw out some more questions, we'll be glad to talk to them. 
uh, talk about them in future question nights. But we're going to begin with this, Max. Maybe this is the most basic question to start with, and that is, does God permit divorce at all? I want to hop over to Luke chapter 16 and throw this passage out. This is Luke 16 and verse 18. Because there Jesus says, Max, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. In that passage, there doesn't look like there's much room for divorce at all. In that passage, there is none. However, in Matthew, the text that we began with in chapter 19, we're going to read verses 4 through 9. And what we're going to see, I'm going to tell you in advance that Jesus does permit divorce under a very limited circumstance. I will say this, David, that Jesus opens a very narrow door when it comes to divorce. You cannot divorce for just any reason, as some of the Jews uh, were advocating. Jesus opens a very narrow door, and we cannot open that door or force it to be wider than Jesus, okay? Jesus has standards. The world is constantly changing its standards. Jesus has a standard that is unchanging. Sometimes when people look at Matthew 19, they say, well, we can't really understand what Jesus meant. Oh, yes, we can. And so let's read, beginning at verse number 4, this is the Lord's reply to those who ask Him a question about, can you divorce for just any reason? In verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that He who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, let's pause right there at verse number 6, because in essence, Jesus has answered their question at this point. What God has joined together, let not man separate. Is it lawful to divorce your wife for just any reason? Jesus says, obviously not. And he goes back to the beginning and, and they're going to bring up a question. They're not done with Jesus. They're going to say, well, if a man is supposed to stay with his wife, then why did Moses allow for divorce? So let's continue the reading. In verse number 7, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So for a second time in this text, Jesus goes back to the beginning. And it appears to be very clear, David, that the law of Moses, because of the hardness of the people's hearts, allowed some things that Christ is not going to allow. And so Jesus now is giving his standard regarding divorce in verse number 9 when he says, And I say to you, I say to you, not Moses, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So Moses' law allowed some things because of hardness of heart that Jesus does not allow. This is where Jesus opens this very narrow door. The King James Version, if any of you have the old King James, it says, except for fornication. And that's really a very good translation. Uh, translations treat this in a different way, but the word that is used there in the Greek text is the word pornea. That's where the word fornication comes from. And it's important that we understand the meaning of that word. And we cannot give to that word just any meaning that might come to our mind or a meaning that might suit our purposes for the moment. The word pornea involves immoral sexual interaction with another party, David. There is always another party involved. Sexual interaction with another. It's a very broad term, very broad, and it includes all kinds of illicit sexual relationships. Now, sometimes people read Matthew 19 and say, well, Jesus only allowed for divorce if you're guilty, uh, if your partner's guilty of adultery. Actually, that's not what Jesus said. While it may be true that you might uh, 
be allowed divorce if your spouse has committed adultery. He said, except it be for fornication. Adultery is a narrower term. Fornication is a much broader term. Pornea in the Greek text is a broad term. It would involve not only adultery, it would allow divorce for homosexuality, lesbianism, and there are other sexual sins that would involve another party that would also be included in that term pornea. But it appears to always involve contact with another party. I'm talking about sexual contact with another party. Divorce is allowed when an innocent party puts away their spouse because of pornea, this kind of sexual immorality which involves another party. Uh, fornication, pornea, is an act. And there must be evidence of the act. It's not enough for, for, for someone to come along and say, well, I think my wife may be having an affair, so that gives me a right to divorce. Well, you may think a lot of things, but that's not evidence. There needs to be evidence, and that's what we have to look for. Jesus is not throwing open the door saying, except it be your opinion. He said, except it be for fornication. And looking at that term, except it be, that means if and only if this condition is present. There is not allowed, the way that language is laid out, there is not allowed some other cause to be squeezed through that narrow door. Now, some translations, the King James Version says, except it be for fornication. My translation says, unless it be for fornication. It's the same meaning no matter how you cut it. And the same language is used in John 3, 5. You remember John 3, 5 where Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about being born again? Except a man be born again, except one be born of water and spirit, or unless a man is born of water and spirit. That means if and only if this condition is there. So if a man is not born again, no matter what you may say about him, well, I think he's a good man, so he deserves to go to heaven. Jesus said no. This condition of the new birth has to be present or a man will not go to heaven. That's why I use this language, if and only if this condition is there. Someone says, but what about this? What about that? The whatabouts don't mean anything unless you've got the condition of being born again. The person doesn't go to heaven. And so it is here in this text. And we could find other texts that are similar. But the point is, there must be pornea, fornication present. That's the condition under which Jesus allows divorce. And I would add this, David, before I turn it back to you, that if we did not have Matthew 19, verse 9, then our question up here would be, no. Does God permit divorce? No. Because this is the only passage in the New Testament where God authorizes divorce. There are a lot of passages that talk about divorce, and passages that talk about divorce and remarriage. But only Matthew 19 is permissive. And that's important to take note of that. And I challenge anyone to find an exception to that. We're looking here for permission. Does God permit divorce? Matthew 19, verse 9, yes, except it be for sexual immorality. Without this condition, to divorce is wrong and to remarry is equally wrong and that remarriage, Jesus calls it adultery, David. I like the way you describe that is he narrowly, he narrowly opens the door. And it is, I think, a very narrow opening of the door. Now do you understand verse 10, Matthew 19, 10, why the apostles would say, oh, wow, it might be better not to marry at all because only under very extraordinary circumstances am I permitted to put my spouse away. Yeah, the, the Jewish standard was, and Josephus, a Jewish historian who lived in the first century, uh, he wrote in his, uh, in his annals, he said, about this time my wife displeased me, so I divorced her, just because she displeased him. Well, sooner or later that would uh, happen, I suppose, in any marriage. But the point was, the Jews allowed divorces for almost any cause. But Jesus narrows it way down, except it be for sexual immorality. You cannot do it. And so uh, the disciples said, wow, that means if I marry a woman, I have to stay with her for life? And, and David, what is it that people promise when they get married? For better or worse, richer or poor, sickness and health, till death do us part. That's what we promise in 
in the marriage ceremony. You think we'd stop saying that unless we really meant it? Well, I like to ask people when they come and they want to get a divorce, did you mean what you, did did you, you, mean what you, said? What you said when you said, I do? That's and another problem with divorce, by the way. It's breaking a promise. It's breaking a covenant. Well, of course. We can't go down that road. Uh, lots of great stuff to talk about. I want to pose a second question, though, that's related to the first question. Because if there is just this narrow opening where God permits divorce, our second question is, does God then permit divorce because of lust? Would lust fit in the definition of pornea in Matthew 19, 9? Now, let me, let me talk a little bit about why that question is coming up. It's coming up a lot these days. And I think it's related to the problem of pornography. Sure. Pornography, we could spend a lot of time going down this road. Pornography is a very pervasive problem. Lots and lots of men, more and more women getting involved in it, becoming an addictive habit. And I'll just tell you something, folks. If you go down that road, it has an unavoidable impact on the marriage relationship. And so, for example, a man gets, gets wrapped up in that stuff and it's impacting his marriage uh, and, so, and so his wife tires of that and she says, well, I want to put my husband away because, because he's addicted to pornography and, and, and I believe that falls under Matthew 19.9. There's actually another text. I want, to, I want you to turn to Matthew 5 for just a minute. And I want to put this text on the table as well. Matthew 5.28 where Jesus said, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so, Max, there's some people that contend that the lust associated with pornography then would become grounds for putting away a spouse. Well, it doesn't. Uh, just be plain about it. The answer to that question is no. And let me ask the question, and no show of hands, please. How many men in this auditorium have ever lusted for a woman after you got married, lusted for someone else, had improper thoughts? What man has not had an improper thought at one time or another? Therefore, every woman has a right to divorce her husband. And you might be able to reverse that. Every man has a right to divorce his wife. The teaching of Jesus becomes then altogether meaningless if that's the case. But it's not because we reduce the argument to absurdity that the answer to this question is no. Lust does not meet the threshold of the word pornea. Pornea involves interaction with another party. It involves relationship with another party. It involves contact, some kind of sexual contact with another party. And lust just doesn't meet that standard. And furthermore, Jesus is dealing with a different class of adultery. Now, if Jesus had just said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery and that was it, then there might be an argument to be made, but that argument cannot be made based on Jesus' words. We have to look at his own words here. And listen, these aren't my words. I'm not, I'm not uh, modifying his words. This is what he says. He has committed adultery already with her in his heart. And so Jesus suggests that what he is talking about is of a different class, of a different character than adultery itself. Now, now actually, if you pay attention to the context, he's been going back and forth with that. I want you to back up for a second to verse 21. Uh, this is Matthew 5, 21. You've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Well, so what is he saying there? That murder and anger or hatred of the heart are the same thing? Obviously he's not doing that. In fact, we understand what he's doing. He's really moving beyond the outward objective action. And he's getting deeper to the heart where the problem starts. You see that, right? And so you go back to Matthew 5, 28, what is he saying? Well, actually 27, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone looks on a woman with lust for her has committed adultery already in his heart. You see what he's doing? He's now going back from the action of adultery to the issues of the heart that produce it. It is two distinct things. And it does raise a whole set of disturbing questions when one tries to say 
that lust is grounds for divorce because, well, we're going to have to do some things. Number one, you've moved this from objective behavior that can be witnessed for which there can be evidence to sub subjective feelings in the heart. So here's what we're going to have to do. First of all, what's lust? Is, is lust admiring a pretty girl? Is it just a, uh, admiring her appearance? You and I know that there's a place in the heart where David crossed the line in 2 Samuel 11 and went from looking to lusting, but that's in a man's heart. How do you know where that is? And how does someone who doesn't know, where it, know, know his heart know where that is? You see where the problem begins to take place? The, the activity described in Matthew 19, 9 is activity that involves contact, involves action. It's objective as opposed to subjective matters of the heart. You know, Dave, you mentioned the case from 2 Samuel where David looked upon Bathsheba. He looked upon her, had he turned away immediately, and that was the end of it. There would have been nothing wrong there. There would have been no sin. But he looked and then acted upon that. And as you point out, lust within the heart, uh, that's something that is subjective. And how can you judge what is in another person's heart? While lust might be a very common problem, you cannot judge what is in another person's heart. But let's go back to the premise that we were talking about a moment ago that really is not in the question itself. And that is about pornography. Pornography is a very serious problem. It may be the most common sin practiced among Christians today. And I say Christians, I'm using a very broad term when I say that. According to uh, Covenant Eyes, some 52% of men who claim to be Christians have seen pornography within the last few weeks. It is very, very serious. And brothers or sisters for that matter, if you are engaging in looking at pornography, you need to bring it to an end. And there is help for that. Brother Ben has just been engaged in a series of lessons a series of lessons about addictive behavior. And pornography can indeed be an addictive behavior. David, you and I, about two years ago, I think it was, we did a, a video, a by the book on pornography and breaking that cycle. And it's available on the website. I would recommend that any man or woman who has any kind of an issue with pornography, that you watch that video. There is help. There is a way to break the cycle of addiction. And I think one of the things that you're saying, Max, is just because we take the position that the Bible does not permit divorce because of lust, let's be clear about something. There are all kinds of terrible behaviors that can take place in a marriage relationship that aren't grounds for divorce, but they're no less terrible. In fact, if you look back at that passage in Matthew 5, you know, we give a lot of attention to verses 27 and 28, but that's not the whole context on his teaching. In 29, Jesus says, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. Well, well what provoked him to talk about the eyes? The lust he described in verse 28 for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So, so let's just be crystal, crystal clear about something. To say that lust is not grounds for divorce does not minimize what an awful crime it is against one's marriage. And if that's going on at your house, it needs to stop. You need to ask for help with that because if you don't, it will be like a cancer that will destroy your relationship. But if we're going to stand with Jesus, we cannot take the position that it is a ground for putting away one spouse. Okay, so it's, uh, it's 544. We've got two more questions. You up for this? Go. All right. Question number three. Does God di permit divorce provided I don't remarry? So I'm in an unhappy relationship. I won't remarry, so is it okay for me to get divorced? No. Okay, question number four. <laughs> Look, David, uh, in my early preaching years in central Indiana, I preached for eight years before I moved to Texas, that area at that time was a hotbed of this teaching, that divorce is okay as long as you don't remarry. When I moved to Texas, there were a number of people in, here in, the, in Southeast Texas who believe that doctrine. I'm talking about Christians. 
It's okay to divorce as long as you don't remarry. Where do you get that in the Bible? You see, the remarriage, an unlawful divorce, followed by an unlawful remarriage, Jesus called adultery. Someone says, well, that's where the sin is when the remarriage takes place. But you're violating the will of Jesus when you divorce without cause. Matthew 19, verse 6, a verse we read a few moments ago, said that these two shall be one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Could it be any clearer? There we have an imperative command from Jesus, let not man separate. God has Join these two together in holy wedlock. Let not man put asunder. Doesn't make any difference which translation you read. Jesus said, do not divorce. That's the will of Christ. Now someone says, yeah, but, but it's not a sin. Well, what is a sin then? To, to go against the words of Jesus, to disobey his command, is that not a sin? Jesus said, don't do it. Someone says, I'm going to do it, and it's not sin. I don't know how you make that not sin. In fact, let's just be clear, it's not just someone choosing to exercise the legal option. I mean, even being separated from your spouse is contrary to Scripture. Now, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5, because some people will look at this text and argue that it approves of separation. This is 1 Corinthians 7, 5, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And so say, well, here's an example of people getting separated. Not the way people talk about separation today. These are two people who are spending some time apart because they're devoting some time to the Lord, not trying to get away from each other. So number one, what people are doing today is not what this text is talking about at all. But notice, he talks about them coming back together so you won't be tempted. Let's be clear. We have responsibilities to one another in our marriage. And one of the problems with living apart is we're neglecting marital responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I've got to be faithful to the vows I made. Remember, it wasn't just until death do us part. It was for better, for worse, richer, for poorer. And it just didn't in our wedding vows. It's in Ephesians 5. I've got duties toward my wife. She has responsibilities toward me. They are commands of God that I am required to, to fulfill. And someone says, well, what if I've just got a disagreeable spouse that's kind of hard to get along with? You know, the Bible talks about that too. In fact, in 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter would speak to a wife with a difficult husband. This is 1 Peter 3, 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if, if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. What is this wife supposed to do if her husband is ungodly and disobedient? Be a good wife. Be a godly wife. Be the kind of wife to him that God anticipates. And by the way, that goes both ways. We're not just picking on the wives, right? And some folks in our culture would hear that and they would say that's outrageous. Why would you subject someone to the torment of living with someone who's difficult to live with, with living with someone who's disobedient. My answer to that is try divorce. Try divorce out. You know, we act as though divorce is this panacea that, oh, it helps me escape all my troubles. No, it just trades one, sets of, one set of troubles for a whole lot worse trouble in the vast majority of cases. Why does God say stick it out? It isn't because he sits up in heaven and delights in seeing a struggle. It's because God knows that when we make that choice to step away, there's another pitfall there. You doubt that? Talk to people who've been through divorce. It's awful. It's not an answer. It's another set of trouble. Well, David, sometimes people go to 1 Corinthians 7, though, and they think they find permission. Yes. And so we need to talk about that. Verses 10 and 11. In this context, the apostle is answering some questions that the Corinthians have posed to him. And he says in verse 10, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. What he means there when he says, yet not I but the Lord, he says the Lord has already spoken on this. And the, and the topic under consideration is what the Lord had said in Matthew 19, 6. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So you've got a question about whether it's okay to separate, okay to divorce. The Lord already answered that question. So now to the married 
I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. Now that's interesting language. A wife is not to depart from her husband. Why not? Well, because Jesus said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Would you agree, and I'm asking the audience, you don't need to respond, but just think about it in your own mind. Would you agree that this is a prohibition? That this verse prohibits? Somehow people read this and they think it gives permission. It's prohibitive, not permissive. It says a wife is not to depart from her husband. Does that mean every woman is going to observe their prohibition? Oh, no. Some women would not. They're going to depart anyway. And now what is the consequence? Well, he says, even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and the husband is not to divorce his wife. And so there you've got it stated both ways. A wife is not to depart from her husband. A husband is not to divorce his wife. Those statements are both permissive. But someone says, hey, it says if she does depart, she can remain unmarried. Oh, the ideal is for her to be reconciled. But sometimes, sometimes she cannot be reconciled to her husband. Sometimes a woman would divorce her husband unlawfully, then later realize, oh, I made a huge mistake. I want to go back. Well, he's already finished up the divorce and he's married to another woman and he's not going to leave this other woman. And so now for the rest of your life, you are obligated to live a single life. But here's the point to understand, not, not the consequence out of that, but understand the prohibition in the first place. There are people who take this text, which is prohibitive, and they say, that gives me permission. I don't know how a prohibition ever gets twisted into permission. It doesn't happen. And, and we don't do that with any other passage. 1 John 2, 1. I know where you're going. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. We all agree God doesn't want us to sin. We're prohibited from sinning, right? Yeah, we still do. And so the verse continues. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. It's the same sentence construction, same point. It's not... The, the, the second part of the sentence doesn't make the first part okay, right? He doesn't want us to sin. He's just helping us deal with that problem when we create it. The second part does not give permission to do what was just prohibited. Correct. And, and so that's a, that's a, a problem that I, I guess people are trying to juggle something. But look, folks, if we're trying to get around the teaching of Jesus, just go ahead and admit it. Don't try to play games with Scripture. Because a lot of times people twist and, well, what Peter called in 2 Peter chapter 3, resting, twisting the scriptures to make it say what we want. Let's, let's understand, Jesus opened the very narrow door. And since Jesus said, except it be for fornication, that means if and only if this condition exists, are you permitted to get a divorce. If that's it, then you're not going to find permission over in 1 Corinthians yep. chapter 7. That's a good point. That's a good point. 553, one more question. Someone submitted to this one to me late in the week. What if I am in an unscriptural marriage? Now, this would be a case where someone actually violated the law of God, okay. divorced unlawfully, remarried, they're living in adultery, but then that former spouse dies. So what do they have to do if their marriage was unscriptural, but now their former spouse has died? Well, Romans chapter 7 says something about that. In Romans 7, 2 and 3, it talks about a woman who is bound to one man while married to another. This is before the man has died, obviously. The woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she's free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. You know, a good case of this in the Bible is found in Mark chapter 6, where you've got King Herod who is married to Herodias, but John the Baptist says, that's your brother Philip's wife. And so Herodias is married to one man, Herod, while being bound to another man, to Philip. And so this is not just a hypothetical. This is something you actually find in the scripture. And John said, it is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. And so it was an unlawful marriage. So, so what happens when the, the former spouse dies? 
I could tell you a story, <laughs> and I'm, it'll be a very short one. I'm afraid now. I'm afraid. Yeah, making I'm me nervous. Be very afraid. Uh, Elmer Moore told me this story. Some of you knew Elmer Moore. He died several years ago, but he was preaching a meeting up in East Texas, and there was a lady in the congregation who was in this very circumstance where she had divorced her first husband unlawfully, married another man. And Brother Moore studied with her and said, you cannot be right with God while you're married to this man while your first husband is alive. About five years later, he went back to that same church to do another gospel meeting, and this lady comes running up to I him. I know where this is going. Comes running up to him and says, Brother Moore, I've got good news. My first husband died. <laughs> So what do you think, David? The thing that troubles me about the whole scenario is, is the heart. Absolutely. We, we have got to acknowledge in that circumstance that the relationship I'm in was sinful. a sinful relationship. Because folks, till the heart's right, nothing else matters. I've countered folks in that situation. My recommendation has been to repent for their past life of sin. I've even urged them to have a ceremony, maybe just a personal ceremony, being joined in marriage scripturally now that they have the right from Jesus to be bound to each other. Uh, that's right. And repent doesn't just look back and say, hey, I shouldn't have done that. Repent means to look back with sorrow and says, if I had opportunity to do that again, I would not because it was sinning against God. Sin against God. That's exactly right. I, I would add this other thought. You know, folks, the heart is key in all of this. You said a minute ago, you know, when, people, when people decide they want out of marriage, they'll find a way. That's a heart problem. When people are committed to the Lord, we'll find a way to serve Him, whether it's in a troubled culture, a troubled church family, a troubled marriage. We can find a way to serve the Lord when our hearts are committed to Jesus to do His will, Max. That's the key to all. Well, we need to wrap, David. And I'm going to look at a passage that does address the heart here in the very end. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, the heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Ultimately, our relationship with God, as David pointed out, is one of the heart. A heart that wants to be right with God. We sing a song sometimes as an invitation song, Is Thy Heart Right With God? And I would ask you to examine your own heart. Think about your motives and your actions. And maybe there's someone here tonight that looks at their own heart, David, and says, I know I'm not right with God. I've been saying things that are not right. I've been carrying tales or gossip or whatever it may be. Or, look, I've never become a Christian, and I should have a long time ago. My heart has not been right with God. It's time for me to make my heart right. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then say so. Repent of sin and be baptized into Christ. If there's one who would do that tonight, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Come now, please.